Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome back to another installation of Native Plants at Noon, brought to you by Deep Roots KC. I'd like to thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the L Native Plants at Noon Sweet 16 Reveal Edition. Um, we are going to be live uh, in the ever-famous Anita Gorman Discovery Center with our perennial hosts, Sydney and Alex. They're going to walk us through five beautiful examples of peak expressions of our Sweet 16 list. Um, but before we get too far into it here, I'd like to make a few announcements and refresh some of those ideas that were looping in our slideshow before we went live. We would really like to thank today's sponsors, uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, and we want to reach out and share a special thanks for donors like you. Um, our individual donors are the lifeblood of our organization, in addition to our partnerships uh, across multiple sectors and multiple organizations. Be sure to check out September's fall plant sale. Saturday, September 9th, Deep Roots is hosting uh, our plant sale from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. there in front of the Gorman Discovery Center. Visit our website under deeproots.org and click on our plant sale event page to learn about three consecutive weekends of native plant sales in Kansas City. Uh, fall is the perfect time to plant natives, and as the weather cools down, uh, it's never too soon to start uh, digging in and getting your native plant selections in. Pre-ordering from vendors for the September 9th sale is a great opportunity for you to put your name on the specific species of plants that you like, including the Sweet 16. Uh, and those resources are gonna be linked uh, as well. Um, if you missed the August 3rd webinar, you've gotta go back and check it out. We'll link to that uh, in the chat as well today. It'll be in the resources that follow up with you. Um, and um, it's exciting. This is a, a project that we've been working on collaboratively with Deep Roots and a lot of our partners and contributors, and we're really excited to see that today uh, in the flesh out at Anita Gorman. Don't forget as well, we continue our diligent volunteer work with Work and Learn Gardening Days there at the Discovery Center as well. One coming up this Saturday, 8 a.m. You can join Sydney uh, and work alongside and learn in the demonstration gardens and across the campus of the Discovery Center. New opportunity here, natural resource management field trips, September 13th and 20th. If you're a landowner who is actively engaged in invasives removal in a woodland, or if you're trying to restore a grassland area at larger scale, uh, we've created this field trip opportunities to join Johnson County Parks and Rec and Kansas City Wildlands professionals on site in large scale management areas to discuss honeysuckle remediation efforts and grassland restoration in two different sites that will help to demonstrate different levels of input and outcome. Uh, sign up again, deeproots.org slash events, really geared towards our larger land stewards. This webinar and all of its resources are going to be recorded and posted to the Deep Roots website following the broadcast. So without further ado, I say we go live to Sid and Alex on site at Anita Gorman Discovery Center down there on Troost. Hey, Chris, how's it going? Hello. Fan <laughs> fantastic. Good to see you. Uh, you got some good treats in for us today. We sure do. So before we Take begin, away. this is Alex. That's Sydney. And we are your landscape stewards here at the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center. And we're so excited to cover a few of these plants today from the Sweet 16 list. Um, so first, we're going to actually head out into the parking lot to view a couple of our bioswale areas there and check out some of the first species that we're seeing on the list. Yeah, I think this is a really fun time to do. I can talk while we walk. That sounds great. This Let's do it. This is a fun time to do this because we're kind of in that fun little space between like summer blooms and fall blooms and although we've had really nice rain um in the Kansas City area and Missouri in general we're about to hit a real hot street here but uh these are the plants who can handle this like hot summer time that special time <laughs> when pollinators need a lot of extra 
uh, nutrition. Yeah. And refuge. And, you know, I think a lot of times we talk about um, our milkweed friends, like butterfly milkweed, common milkweed. Um, but I don't think we often talk about our world milkweed, which we notice here at the Discovery Center is by far one of the favorites. And Elle, yes. here, I'm going to hand this I? to you. Okay, thank you. We have our umbrella today, so our yes. phone doesn't overheat. <laughs> and I'm just going to go ahead and turn the camera around. Okay. So can I talk about why we chose uh, um, world milkweed for the Sweet 16 out of all the milkweeds? Do you want to talk about it, Sydney? Should we? Okay, I'm going to. Yes, let me see if I can get some you get wasp there. action there. Got some wind going on today, too. Yeah. Uh, so this is world milkweed. Would you like to talk about it? Or so, don't, would you, yeah. Jump in, Al. <laughs> yeah, so um, this is, I'm going to hold the camera still, but the wind is uh, giving us um, a little bit of action here. But uh, we, this is the world milkweed. This is uh, a a uh, Sclepius verticillata, and it's one of our shorter milkweeds. It's I would say it's like about the same size as butterfly milkweed, depending. But butterfly milkweed didn't make the list because it is very, very picky about its uh, uh, conditions. And world milkweed we find is much less picky and spreads so much nicer than uh, butterfly milkweed. And these white flowers, Sydney, do you want to talk about the white flowers? Yeah. Okay. So. As you notice, look how tiny these flowers are here. So compared to some of the other milkweed species, um, they're not nearly as large, but something kind of cool about that is they, they're more, I, I was about to say. I know, I'm sorry, I just, I just, I just totally, uh, yeah, just what you were gonna say, right? Well, okay, so what we just learned from our friend Bill White recently is that bumblebees are uh, red, green colorblind, and they don't often pollinate white flowers. Now we just saw an exception there. That well, that could bee. have been a carpenter bee, though. Maybe. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it was a bumblebee. But um, carpenter bees have that shiny butt. Um, These are also so very fragrant too, so that they may are play fragrant. into the pollinators. But thinking okay. about who would pollinate these plants, right? Oh, we got a bee fight going on. So you see, there are some bumblebees, but uh, white flowers are very attractive to our pollinator friends, like wasps and moths. So we actually did a nocturnal pollinator program the other evening and came out here and we saw some interesting moths, some that were beetle mimics, um, and we even saw monarch caterpillars feasting on these. Now we came out here earlier to see if we could find any, but we haven't. Um, but I love this plant because it is a shorter height compared to our taller milkweed species and it is um, it doesn't outcompete other plants. It can be towards the front of a garden bed. And it has such an unusual fine textured foliage compared to um, our plants like uh, the other milkweeds. Yes, any other and, milkweeds and can I say about the foliage too, um, you'll see that monarchs do prefer some milkweeds over others. Common milkweed is really hard to eat for a baby caterpillar. They will eat it if there's nothing else left, but, um, but um, uh, some of our like smaller leaved milkweeds are much easier to digest for the caterpillars. So our world milkweed and our swamp milkweed, they do prefer to um, uh, lay eggs on those. I think something I think. else that's interesting, I'm just going to go ahead and um, off camera, I'm pinching off a leaf just to see, because um, we all know with milkweed, they have kind of a, a milky um, latex type of sap that comes out. But I think there's less, I'm going to assume there's less latex sap in this compared to the other milkweeds. Absolutely. Which was, is also probably helpful for the little tiny monarch caterpillars. Yes. And we see we have a monarch, right? Oh, it's not going to do for the camera, but <laughs> there's a monarch right there looking around. Oh, sorry. That's not a, that's not a monarch. That's not a monarch. <laughs> I got tricked. We did see tricks. a monarch just a little bit ago. Oh my gosh. Never but mind. there's tons of, of pollinators on them. So it's not just a great host plant for our monarchs. It is also... Um, yeah, I'm going to take over. It's also um, a great nectar source. So let's yeah. take another look here at this. And also take note, we're here in the parking lot. So I do want to make note that this um, is the garden that was designed uh, and maintained by Down to Earth here at the Discovery Center. Um, and this, this milkweed is a perfect choice for this garden because take note how short everything is, right? Um, in this space, we don't want tall plants along this edge, along the sidewalk here. Um, 
So it's very dry, very rocky, very hot, right? Concrete island. Um, and this, island. this um, these plants are doing fabulous. They haven't been uh, watered really. Uh, they might get hit by a sprinkler every now and then, but not too much. And it spreads really well too. And I think you've heard us say this before, but compared to the other milkweeds um, here at the Discovery Center, monarchs definitely prefer marsh and world, wouldn't yes, you say? Yes, yes, they'll choose those first, I think. Yeah. Over. And um, also I wanted to mention that with butterfly milkweed and maybe with world milkweed, oh my gosh, it's Matt Bond! Oh. <laughs> we have this a guest from Matt Bunch. This is our guru. <laughs> this is the man who started it all. Matt Bunch, you're on Native Plants at Noon. Say hi. Yeah. Oh gosh, that's so we have so many friends out here today. Nice seeing you, Matt. Okay. We have out here. He knows all the answers to all the mysteries. He does. Everything. So man, there's so many friends out here. <laughs> We're gonna keep walking no, sorry, just to I'm stay sorry. on track. I finish that. I so um um actually the caterpillars that feed on butterfly milkweed are not toxic because the butterfly milkweed doesn't have that the same uh, level of toxin in the, with the sap as the common. Is that milkweed. right? Yeah, isn't that crazy? Oh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, but I mean, they still benefit from being known as a toxic caterpillar. So I kind of wondered that about world milkweed. If anyone knows, maybe world milkweed is a little bit less, um, but when you, saw, so, when you pinched off that leaf though, I saw latex in it. There totally was, yeah. So wait, I'm sorry, can you, this is new. So, this is totally new to me, yeah, I've never which is so it. exciting. Oh, no. <laughs> That's the thing I love about nature, y'all. Um, so what you're saying is some monarch caterpillars are more toxic than others, depending yes. on the type of milkweed they're consuming. That's right. That's right. It's not. Great I'll have to do some research on that. That's interesting. You don't have to believe me. Look it up. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Told me that. <laughs> I'm not. All right. <laughs> okay, well, Chris. As we're walking to our next spot, what else? What do we got? Yeah, we do have a couple really good questions about world milkweed. I, I love that that is just something that we settled on as a community of, of plant experts uh, for those reasons um, that you've highlighted. Um, quick question from Cindy, who wants to know uh, if world milkweed uh, handles wet soil. I know it to be an upland, sandy, drier, uh, uh, favoring plant. Is that your experience? Yes. So far, if yeah. If you have wet soil, do marsh milkweed. Always Ooh, marsh milkweed. Yeah. Always. That's the one you want, for sure. Yeah. 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 It's a monarch's favorite. That's number one, I think. Um, our friend Anthony, I don't know if you're watching Anthony, but I saw he posted the other day, he had eight monarch caterpillars on his marsh milkweed oh, in Raytown. We have a hard time keeping summer, ours. Yeah. I know you all have heard me say this, but we have a hard time keeping ours alive because the caterpillars eat it all down. Like there's no leaves left to do. Which is exactly what you want. And exactly. then just plant more. People, right? Yeah. People yeah. are like, well, what do you do? Plant more. Plant more. That's the great Exciting. question. Yeah. So well, we don't that. have a really good spot for marsh milkweed here. So if you're lucky enough to have a wet spot in your yard, absolutely. First plant you got to do is marsh milkweed. Perfect. Fantastic. That's my understanding too. I just don't have a good spot that's wet enough, consistently enough to support marsh milkweed. Um, regarding milkweeds in general, Pamela uh, wants to know, and this is something I've experienced so often, that her milkweed is covered with aphids. Now, I know what you're going to say. I think it's okay, right? Leave them be. It is okay, okay but so I, what I would say is as long as you have enough plants um, that they're not getting totally destroyed by the aphids and you're drawing in our friends or wasp friends because uh, those are your friends that are going to eat those aphids same and with ladybugs, ladybugs too um, also just a quick note please don't go buy ladybugs and tree mantis and things like that because a lot of times they're not the native variety um, so instead a great thing to do to attract the native predators uh, beneficial predatory insects rather is to plant more native plants. Slender mountain mint will draw them in. Um, gosh, any white flower wasps really love. So I know people may be thinking like, oh God, Sid, I don't want to get stung. I've never been stung in my life. And in yes. fact, we can get really close to the wasps um, yeah. and just observe their beauty. Um, one other real quick thing to do um, is to leave uh, habitat for your wasps too. And I know that sounds crazy, but uh, bare earth, uh, brush piles, these are the things you want to have a healthy wasp population. We're not talking about um yellow jackets or the paper wasps but there's a huge variety of wasps that are out there yeah brown nest i know we went a little adjacent there but the ape the, or <clears throat> the orange oh, sorry, aphids yeah, you're aphids. seeing are fine 
They're um, fine, but but just make sure you have enough resources to keep things in balance. Yes, they're not. Um, the the yellow ones are not actually. I don't think those are native. The oleander aphids, um, and they can become a problem when you have when you don't have enough plants and you don't have predators um, feeding on them. That's what happened to some of our marshmallow feed was, mm. and the cat and the monarchs won't lay eggs on super infested plants so I ended up smashing them all by hand that was a silly thing. I'm gonna pop our camera around yeah. excellent great answers for those questions um uh hopefully Cindy and Pamela that covers kind of what you had thought uh to ask oh and please don't Let's... use uh neem oil on your aphids because that'll kill your caterpillars and your bumblebees and yeah. stuff I learned I... that recently too. <laughs> Pam Pamela did ask if I can spray and I didn't even ask no, you don't because do it. I knew don't do it. Don't spray them. Just rub All your right. plants. Just smush them up. Yeah. Smush them. Okay. Smush them. Take, turns a nice so, orange. Yeah, right. Make some ink out of it. Okay, we're at our next plant. Two out of five of the 16 of the top 16 list. And we have prairie drop seed today. Um, so this is one of our grasses. This is a great clump forming um, perennial. I love the smell. You can't, well, maybe, let me show you. Let me just show you all big whiff. Let's take a bit whiff. <laughs> Those seed heads here, once they form, they're really fragrant. What do you think they smell like? Um, Sometimes popcorn, but usually like um cilantro or soap. I definitely get a cilantro smell. And I thought, I'm pretty sure we really? just learned while we were in Minnesota, isn't prairie drop seed edible? Yes, yes. And some, um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know anything else about it, so sorry. But, <laughs> but I thought that was interesting. Always, it, it smells really delicious to me. I love cilantro, um, so that was something kind of cool when I was like, "Oh, I wonder." Um, but yeah, so this is a full sun uh, species. We have it in our formal rock garden here. It does make a nice formal addition to landscape spaces. So right here along the sidewalk, um, I would say it prefers like dry to average soil. What do you think, Al? Yeah, I've never seen it in wet soil or medium soil yeah think. it's a prairie species. so it's hanging out here you see it's like nice and fluffy um there are some maintenance techniques i'd like to recommend for prairie drop seed to make it look nice and full like this um in early spring because this is the formal part of our garden here at the discovery center we do cut this section a little bit earlier than we normally would uh to let you know insects um overwinter but with this type of prairie drop seed, there's not really anything overwintering in the stem. So what we do is we will actually grab the base, grab the whole chunk of hair. It's like a, a haircut, right? Grab it like a ponytail. And then we would cut right below where my hand is. Um, we do that in about, what was that, late March even, early April? Yeah, it, it kind of uh, maintains kind of a nice winter look if it well, if it's not smashed down by snow a bunch of times. Yeah. That, it... But the, the point of doing that is once it starts to grow back up later in the season, it looks so full like these. So that was the method we did um, to these plants. And they really bounce back nicely. They put on some gorgeous foliage. Um, and we, we did like a kind of a test study um, for the, this other plant or the same plant, but just cutting it back even later and notice how much smaller they are. So um, again, Alex and I, we'd like to talk about your uh, plants you choose, your maintenance techniques, everything is determined by your gardening goals. So you wanna first determine that. Are you looking for a more formal kind of aesthetic? Um, are you lo looking to support birds specifically or pollinators? Then knowing those goals will inform your plant decisions and then from there, how you take care of them. Yeah, and, and we always talk about how grasses are so important. They should be part of every design you do, at least a grass or a sedge. Absolutely, so, and look how beautiful it is. Yeah, drop seed is so perfect to have a purple poppy mallow, rose verbena. Oh. It holds up liatris. Yeah. It's such a good companion plant for other all prairie species it is okay chris as we're walking do you have any more questions for us from the audience i i think i also saw tracy our friend tracy flowers might have um found some insight about the monarch caterpillars i don't know if you want to chime in with that i didn't get a chance yeah. to read it but 
Tra- Tracy T, Tracy Twombly, our friend at So Wild. Oh, Maybe. hi, Tracy. Um, and, and exactly like you were saying, there's this whole spectrum, apparently, of toxicity, depending on the species that, that hosted it. Um, Soriaca and honey vine milkweed, Sinancum, are not nearly as toxic even as Verticillata, the world milkweed. And then we know that, <gasps> no, number one, uh, going further, uh, number one favorite is the marsh milkweed, the Incarnata. And now what it what it goes further, this is Chip Taylor's uh, team's research from monarchwatch.org in Lawrence. Um, how much is the metabolic cost for monarchs trying to process these, these plants? And the quote ends, turns out that only 25 to 40 percent of the population being toxic will confer the protection for the re- for the every monarch caterpillar. What? That's crazy. Right. How cool so is that? So I, I read this. So if I see a monarch caterpillar on a common milkweed, um, I can eat it, right? Is that what that means? Sure. Yeah, that sure is. The, Don't put bugs in your mouth until you cook them. All right, all right. Okay. Let's uh <laughs> to get to the Q&A here. Just a few. Uh, In that lovely planting alongside the sidewalk there with the prairie drop seed, I saw a couple different things that you use as accents growing in between there. Yes. Can, could you identify a couple of those? I thought I saw Rose Rubina. You did. You saw Rose Verbena, which did not make our Sweet 16 list, though it is a fabulous addition to Native Garden. It'll give you some early blooms. It was uh, the ground cover. Uh, and actually, I can show you a sample of that over here as we go to our I next one. I didn't plant. make it because it's just a little bit tricky to prune and to take care well, of in the winter. It also And it's moves. picky about where it wants to be. So here's that, uh, the Rose Verbena that we saw. Uh, sand, uh, placed in between the prairie drop seed. So yeah, you know, um, I think it's nice to have those accents. We also have Missouri Bean Primrose, which is this plant here. It's not in bloom right now, but it does have some really interesting um, seed pods right now, which I think is very cool. So those were a couple of the species that you saw in between them. So we had the nice clumps of uh, prairie drop seed, um, grass, and then have some of our perennial forbs in between. Wonderful. That's awesome. I know of a couple uh, larval hosts uh, or, or, or invertebrates that use drop seed as a larval host. Can you identify any of those uh, pollinators uh, that, that um, complete their life cycle or mammals, birds, and things that enjoy the cilantro flavored uh, seed <laughs> bank. Yeah, I can't think of who, ho- I know, I can't think of who hosts on it, Chris, but no. I do know prairie drop seed and our clump forming grasses are really important habitat for uh, beetles. Um, so it gives them a place to overwinter, uh, which is really important for them. Um, so I know there's that aspect. If you can, yeah. if you remember, Chris, feel free to chime in, but I'm not yeah. remembering who hosts um, on it. So, and, and obviously birds, the seeds are really big oh, yeah. and bump and nice. So birds are feeding off the seeds. Um, but, uh, we, there's so little that we know about some of our invertebrates and what their host plants are. Um, this is just a fancy way to say we don't know, but we did a mothing program here this week. And in um, our moth book, uh, what, what's, what, what is the Peterson guide? Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> and on a lot of the species, it just says host unknown. There's so little known about these things. So I've ne- we've never seen anything specifically hosting on the uh, drop seed grass. And it's not, not that common to have uh, grass as a, as a uh, host plant. Yeah, but except if you're a generalist. But I'm curious, Chris, do you know of any? Yeah, Chris. Um, I remember Branhagen talking about, uh, Branhagen and Arduous are talking about skippers and how yeah, they're such an yeah. under, undersung yeah. little section of the, the uh, lepidopteral world. Yes. And, and that, that yeah. skippers, so, some, some range of them, uh, favor hosting on that young prairie drop seed like you create uh, when you do that early season prune. Uh, that green flush uh, that comes in late spring or, um, or excuse me, uh, late spring, early summer is prime fodder for those caterpillar larvae of nice. apparently skippers and like hair streaks or something Very like that. Cool. cool. Well, that, the more you know. <laughs> um, I don't know if you all just saw that. We had a really beautiful monarch caterpillar uh, or sorry, monarch butterfly on this oddly shaped 
blazing star. So we're going to talk about our next um, plant on the Sweet 16 list. This is a uh, rough blazing star, or sorry, or also known as Eastern blazing star. Nope, sorry, Eastern blazing star. I know the Latin name, it's Liatra scariosa. <laughs> yeah, it's also called Sabine. So different than our uh, our friends, the Prairie Blazing Star, which has the more uh, spike rod shaped flowers that finished blooming already. Uh, the next one in this garden here is um, the Eastern Blazing Star. And so it has these little uh, buds that go all the way down the stem and it'll bloom from the top down. And um, this one, Al, can you talk a little bit about what's going on here? Well, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm sure, I can talk about it. So this <laughs> looks like spatiation, which is common in plants. It happens all the time where it just mutates normally. What we're hoping it's not is something called Aster's yellow, which is a viral, uh, viral disease that affects um, plants in the Asteraceae. Uh, family so that's like almost everything we have in here that's echinacea that is sunflowers that is uh blazing stars and so we're really hoping that's not what it is but these can happen pretty pretty commonly you'll see them on a lot of different and places. so let's kind of describe what's happening well i guess let's back up over there i'll go look at some of those real quick because yeah the, the blazing star over there is normal and then we'll come back and look at this and see the difference but um, your blazing star should look more like this, <laughs> like these little puff balls here. Look yeah. at that. Well, this is actually dotted blazing star, isn't it? Aspera? Rough, yeah. It could be. I don't think that's I have story. Aspera. What about that right there? Oh, wow. Oh, man. Maybe all of these are. Dang. I know. See, this is where it gets like. This is where it gets. Yeah, yeah when you see lots of than... your flat. We're all discovering this together live with you all, <laughs> our dear, dear audience. <laughs> Um, I'm curious about what's going on here with these plants because we're noticing this um, almost flat um, fan shape rather than the round um, buttons. Buttons, yeah. These are what the buttons are. So they should look, look like. like this. Yeah. Um, oh, we got a little tiny crab spider. Uh, something else I love about the Liatra species is um, the looper caterpillars which um, are the type of caterpillars that take little bits of plant and stick them to their back, spe especially like little bits of flower. And they look just like a flower moving in the wind. Now I haven't seen any yet this year, um, but once they hatch or once they um, go through their transformation, they become the uh, wavy lined emerald moth, which is one of my favorite moths. I was a little sad we didn't see any the other day, but it's, they're just getting started this year. Okay, any questions about our blazing star? Um, I think you all have heard that we recommend you plant uh, multiple species of blazing star in your garden if you want to have continued color throughout the summer. Um, but other than that, I think that's kind of the, the thing. Um, I will also, I guess, real quick point out that this is in some good shade right now, um, and, but it does get a lot of sun in the morning and then again in late afternoon. So I would consider this kind of a savanna-esque, not, you know, not exactly, but kind of in that case. So you can always push your boundaries on it or push the boundaries of where you place it. But it is typically a prairie full sun species. But Yeah, savanna blazing stars only when you can kind of like push into a little bit of shade. Yeah, but, but the these, all, the these all are handling this bit, a little bit of shade. Yeah. But they're still getting a lot of sun, so... Any questions you, before we move yeah. on to our next plant, Chris? No, nah, currently uh, Q&A is empty. Um, All right, good. Well, we're going to move uh, on. Curious if we maybe, do, should you clean your tools before oh touching my other gosh. plants? Yes, we should. Yes, we should. Thank Thanks, you. Patty. Good idea Thank there. You, Patty. Um, well, yes, we should it, clean our tools. Because yeah. fungal or bacterial infection can can always be a root cause of of weird expressions of blooms like that, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. Absolutely true. It's absolutely yeah. true. Absolutely. What's interesting though about these is I've never cut these. Yeah, these have never been cut, but we have some other flowers yeah. that are close to these that have, I mean, probably been cut. We don't cut flowers very often, but um, sometimes for bloom tea. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna sit right down here, get level to level with these plants. Okay, I know people always um, are curious about our fencing, so I'll just uh, tell you all the bamboo hoops come from Gardener's Edge. That's online, you can find that. Um, they're really nice. I was thinking last night, I might be, it might be time to remove these maybe yeah. before the end of the year. I don't know. Yeah, the year. They have, they're really, they're really fun though. Okay, I was hoping to find a side out that was um, blooming still, oh. but over here, I'm not seeing much. So we're looking at our next grass friend side oats grama and now i used to think why the heck are their plants called blue grandma side oats grandma hairy grandma and then al was like sid it's not grandma it's grama like graminoids like grasses and i said oh that makes more sense could be graminoids, too. Could be graminoids. maybe it's graminoids so this is another great clump forming grass um it does get a bit bigger than the prairie drop seed you think so i do think so i think it I think I it can. To, I have to respectfully disagree. You respectfully disagree. I, I think it gets taller than it does wider compared, but I don't know. I also, oh, I see some that's blooming over here. Let's go look at this. Crawling around on the ground over here. <laughs> okay. I think these just have the most beautiful blooms. Let's see. Look at that. I hope that translates. It may not. Sarah Beyer had a lovely photo of the side oats in bloom during her presentation for Lunch and Learn last month. Um, but it kind of blew my mind when I realized grasses, like other plants, bloom. I know that may seem silly, but it just kind of makes grasses feel even more special in my, my eyes. So, just... Yeah, and grasses are, um, like the flowers are very small, they're minuscule, so you can, you can, when you think about the shape of a flower, you can imagine who pollinates it and who pollinates this one is wind. 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 Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, that is our, let's oh, see. We didn't do Rebecca. Oh, we missed Rebecca. I was like, where, what number are we on? Four, I think. There's so many plants and so little time. But we're doing pretty good on time this, this time around. Aren't we? <laughs> time, time, time. That's so good this news, is, though. We've got a few questions uh, queued up here as well. Um, perfect. Let her rip. Go for them? Yeah, let's do um, it. A couple of folks, uh, we brought up the tool cleaning, whether that be the hands that you used or the pruners. Uh, uh, what is your preferred cleaning technique? I personally use a, a very light solution of bleach because it's cheap. Um, nice. Just a little I squirt bottle and wipe it off with a, a Some clean diluted. cloth. Yeah, that's Very a really diluted. good idea. Diluted bleach, um, rubbing alcohol I've used. Um, yeah, I kind of just like, what do I have <laughs> available? A greasy uh, rack. A greasy <laughs> rack. No, it is really important to clean your tools, especially, you know, when you're working in a big landscape like this, where there's nine acres of hundreds, maybe over a thousand plant, different plant species here. Oh. You think? No, 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 just hundreds. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But anyway, yeah, I would say make sure you clean them, especially if you're like pruning trees, like some of our longer. That's so important, that's so important because those trees got to be around for a long time. You know, they don't die back every year like our some of our perennials do. Um, yeah, they're much more susceptible to uh, diseases. Absolutely. That's a great question. I, yeah, uh, I thought so as well. Um, and then uh, this comes up almost every time we talk about liatris. Um, we get feedback from folks that identify that bl these blazing stars come up, they're healthy, they're happy, then they flop. Mm. Uh, let's, let's reiterate a couple of those kind of approaches to liatris that can help support that plant with its heavy full bloom uh, yes. structure in those spikelets. Okay, I'm gonna show you all an example. Back over here. Okay, so no, these um, taller spikes back here, this is the prairie blazing star. So different liatris species, but still, I mean, you can see the other ones in here too. Notice they're not flopping. That's partly because they're, the way this garden was planted, everything was packed in so tight that their roots, um, 
we'll all interact and help support each other below the surface. Um, it's important to also think about root morphology or also known as the different shapes of our root systems, right? So if you just have a bunch of tap roots, um, kind of like the uh, liatris, you know, they got those big corms um, that are delicate that go straight down. Um, if you don't have fibrous roots around them to support them, then it's probably going to flop. Uh, we had a, an example at our South Pond Garden, which is a little too far away to walk to right now, but um, the liatris, though it's beautiful there, it is flopping, but that's because it's like right up against a rock and in a situation that it wouldn't normally be in. <laughs> yeah. Some plants have, uh, liatris has very famously tiny little, like the corn, well, the cor they can be bigger as they age and that will always help a plant stand up. But in the first few years, we always tell people, you may need to stake your liatris. Um, it's really important to plant companion plants with it. Um, that's ultimately the thing you need to do for all I ask mm -hmm. is have some grass or somebody else holding it up. I think it also it. just looks see. better. Yeah. Oh yeah. It looks way better. You can see these, these want to flop, but they're kind of. One is a couple are flopping out. Very floppy. Yeah. But um, they're kind of supported by this willow leaf sunflower. There's blue stem and drop seed in this little bed too. Can you pull so that the, flower out so we can look sure. at it better? So the, um, this is rough blazing star. This is dotted blazing, right? Oh my god, am I wrong? Blazing star is hard. No, this is rough blazing star. That's the aspera. <laughs> yeah, and uh, this one is uh just a little bit shorter than the prairie, mm -hmm. say, like normally. But with with liatris, we always notice that they they grow really tall in the second year and and usually flop, and then they kind of mellow out after the the um second or third year. But definitely plant companions with it it can't be alone yeah plant companions um plant some grasses as those companions they no. look good they they support it really well yeah. too. and you can use the, the bamboo hoops or mm -hmm. iris sticks whatever whatever you need to use to stake up your plants you can do that too Absolutely. no shame no shame in that game in fact we drive around kansas city all the time and we love to see people's native plant gardens oh wow look at that wash that's really pretty Whoa. um and sometimes we see our friends stake in their their liatris and we we support that okay look at that beautiful wasp did y'all see that this is uh feeding on the the nectar and pollen from our friend uh rudbeckia herda um also known as brown-eyed susan which i'm not a big fan of that name but um it is what it is this is such a cheery yellow flower there's a lot of rudbeckia species here at the discovery center and in general um, we have Missouriensis over there and Triloba mm -hmm. somewhere else. Yeah, um, and we have um, Subtomentosa too, and um, what's the third one we have? Or we had five at, at one point. I don't know if they've all. Not all of them have survived. There's a Rubecchia for every situation, just like there's a Liatris and milkweed for every situation. Yeah shorter ones taller ones if you're looking for a plant that has prolific blooms and can fill out a space um this is definitely the one that you'll want to pick out um this one is a little taller have you tried Al? have you tried chelsea chopping no but Rebecca? i know you can. i don't think i have but i know you could so if you've watched us before you know we've talked about the chelsea chop um which is what al calls the method of cutting plants back um before they bud out to kind of help contain their height and promote um, extra blooms. It mimics herbivory. Um, so you can do this with a lot of different species of plants, so at, especially things in the Asteraceae family. Okay, look at that cute wasp. Tell me that's not cute. It is so cute. It's a thread-waisted wasp. And look, it's not stinging me. It's not, I'm not bothering it. It's just, doing its thing i'm just doing my thing wasps, wasps are so some cool some of the calmest insects we have here out in the native bird thank you cindy sweetland it is adorable i right, agree <laughs> so i don't know what else do we say about this plant al it's pretty tall here in this situation um yeah but yeah chelsea chop it for sure it looks good in yeah, a huge, huge stand so what, one thing we talked about with um bill white was that um what bumblebees and pollinators love is like a big group of flowers because it's easier to find. It's easier to get a lot more energy from one spot. And this plant 
absolutely must be planted in a in a group. You got to have a bunch of these, I think. Absolutely. Well, I mean, they want it, that's what they naturally want to do anyway, right? So they want to fill out a space um, and they'll do that. And, you know, a lot of the plants we have on our list, our Sweet 16 list, are not prolific like that because we're trying to keep in the beginning gardener in mind. Uh, and, and not to say that um, experienced gardeners won't benefit from this list, um, but that's just to say that, um, you know, we want to set you all up for success Yeah, and make sure that... Uh, you're, we're suggesting plants that are not going to be a total pain in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> level ones. Right. Put up the level two list next year. <laughs> and just like we always say too, um, there's no such thing as a no maintenance garden. Every single garden requires maintenance, even turf grass lawns, even native plant gardens. Um, so it's just a matter of how much maintenance are you realistically willing to do? Um some, I mean, we enjoy doing that kind of work, but some plants are a little easier to maintain than others. So that's why we selected from this list. Yeah. And I see a lot of comments in the chat. I haven't had a chance to look there, um, but I am curious about um, if we have any more questions, Chris. Um, I, I'm so curious what everyone's asking right now. Yeah, uh, a good question. This this goes kind of takes me back to my nursery uh, propagation days uh, in that section sector of the industry. Um, what's the difference between brown eyed Susan and black eyed Susan as common names uh, for botanical variations of the rudbeckia? Great question. <laughs> you know what we're gonna say? Common names are arbitrary. Common names are arbitrary. <laughs> Absolutely. Five brown-eyed Susan, black-eyed Susan, they're all interchangeable <laughs> in some cases. Yeah. And also, and Rebecca is just told, to be completely honest with all of our viewers, we struggle with keying out Rebecca's. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them in, in Missouri. Um, some you'll find more readily at your local uh, native plant nurseries. Um, but yeah, so... Just wanted to be transparent yeah, so, about that. Yeah, yeah. What we what we say, you know, common names, fine. But if you're looking for something specific, make sure you go in with the Latin name. Totally. That's it. And you did identify what what particularly about Rudbeckia herta was what we favored over Foldiga or or other uh, variations of that. Do you remember in those sessions? Hmm. So I have to admit, <laughs> Rudbeckia Missouriensis is one I love. Yeah. <laughs> I fought for and a I different one. For no, Rebecca. Yes. Chris, did you fight for this one? Can you answer this? Uh, I believe that we favored Herta because of its availability in the nursery industry. That makes sense. Oh, well, we could show that. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it's it's just, it's such a welcoming plant. Um, I, I love Rebecca's. And, um, you know, I think, again, depending on your gardening situation, um, if you need a slightly shorter Rebecca, there are shorter ones. Um, if you want one that's, uh, you know, that medium height, like the one we saw, herd is a great option too. Um, Be careful because uh, Rebecca is one of the most cultivated mm -hmm. uh, species. So you're going to find a lot of uh, native ours, cultivars of bees. So you want to go for the true native species to get the most pollinator benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how would one go about ensuring that they're receiving the true native species from their nursery providers? Well, that's a great question. So Alex already mentioned referring to the scientific name is, is crucial. So um, if you are looking at the plant tag, um, like I always say, you don't need to know how to pronounce it, just how to reference it. Um, it won't say like Coreopsis, Lancelotta, X, Sunrise, or sunset or tropical blast or Baja fresh. Like it won't say things like that. It'll, <laughs> it'll, okay, if they did make Taco Bell. If they made a Baja fresh, uh, plants, I, I, I might, would, I would have, I would definitely check it out. <laughs> but um, so that, that's going to be your first way. Uh, well, uh, that's one way. I, actually, I'll step back and say my very first recommendation is to shop local at your small native plant nurseries. We have tons in Kansas city. Uh, so wild city roots, um, you know, We've got um, soil service crit site. There's tons of, of native plant resources here in the Kansas City area. Um, Blackroot Nursery as well. 
So I would just say start there because they're the experts, right? They're the ones growing these plants. They're uh, planting them, seeing how they live and thrive. Um, so they have a lot of great insight. Um, now, you, I would say um, do a little research too on your end. Uh, we've got great resources on our website as well as uh, Grow Native too. But that, those are great ways to figure out where you're going to get the true native plants and make sure you're not getting a cultivar or a native bar. Yeah, she said that uh, if it has the name and an X and another name, but also something in quotations, always stay away from that too. Yeah. Great. Oh yeah. Excellent. Those are well, we, Galena's garden. We're really fortunate in Missouri um, and across Kansas to have some awesome native plant options. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy apples and Parsons on the Kansas side. Um, yeah. Just a, a great community of, of local growers that are really dedicated to their integrity of their species selection. Yeah. Um, good answer. Good answer. Uh, Brown-eyed Susan comes in, according to one of our contributors, as Rudbeckia triloba. Put a triloba mm -hmm. next to a herda and and tell me the difference. It's a difficult one. Can't do um, it. Can't you know, do it. that I was, when we were looking at it, I was like, this could be triloba. It sure could. But You're they, right. You're right. <laughs> but they. Winner. Tough one. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Absolutely. Come up here Either... and we'll give, we'll give you a, a native plant. <gasps> That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a question about seeds. Um, Janine received some side oats grandma seeds right now. Um, do you think that those are ripe enough to be viable uh, at this point in the year? Or, or should harvested collected seed from, from the graminoids be uh, taken later in the year? Um, I, I yeah. always wait for the, the, little, the little thing, the sheath of the seed to crack open. And that's when I know that it's ready to drop which yeah. means it's ready for me to collect. Yeah, I would suggest probably a little bit later, considering we're still seeing some of them blooming. Um, they're, they're still being pollinated. So, um, you know, end of summer um, is good for um, some of the, the plants that have bloomed earlier in the year. Uh, but then really when we get into the fall, that's a great time to start collecting seed. I don't think I've collected seed from side oats before. Um, I definitely have from eyelash grass and have grown that in our greenhouse uh, with a lot of success. Um, but I really want to try growing side oats this year. Yeah, let's try it. We so you would you would want to you need to um, hold well you know you wouldn't want to plant them now. They would need to be uh, stratified. So uh, make sure that you do that over the winter if you're going to plant them for next year. And stratified means stick them in the cool. freezer. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, make, make sure they're a little damp. Some, um, you can get like sand, paper towel, paper sand. towel yeah. and stick them in the freezer for several weeks. Yeah, um, I know uh, Missouri Wildflower Nursery and Prairie Moon Nursery talk about like the different stratification methods you can use there. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, question about Chelsea chopping. Uh, have you ever done it on cup plant or sylphium species in general? Good question. Never on cup plant. What we have done it on is um, helianthus species. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I can't think of a sylphium we've done it to, though they absolutely deserve it. Cup <laughs> plant is a monster. I love cup plant. I'm just Me looking too. over, I'm going to turn the camera around so y'all can see, see I cut what we're looking at. Maybe they're starting to grow back already. We can go see if one's doing that. I'm sure it would though. Sure, it would too. Right. So I was I was weeding over here earlier, and I love cup plant. These were standing up very tall, um, and straight. I mean, they're still tall, but um, not leaning over like they are. So I'm um gonna ask Al after this if I'm allowed to cut this back. But um, <laughs> I already cut it back. That's the sad thing. I already did this. So check this out. Is that the new uh, growth? Yeah, so these are the new leaves. When did you um, cut this back? Maybe like a week or two ago. No way. See, but, well, let me see if I. I'm trying to see if there's a stem that's like no. Nah, I, nah, I mean I it's see too cut late. stem. It's too late now because they're already in full bloom. It's yeah, too totally. Late to do the chop if if it's even close to budding. So you would want to do this much much earlier in the year try it let me know you yeah can't kill it. <laughs> you cannot kill it i'll be impressed if you do yeah, yeah it, it's you. uh <laughs> you'd be hard pressed to to set that one back for more than a couple months it's very very resilient plant i mean it's taller um, than now look at this yeah absolutely um and then 
Uh, qu final question as we come into 10 till here on the one o'clock hour. Um, I found Herda. I found Herda. Hold on, Chris. Making it up to you guys. I think this is, I'm going to laugh. This is just another triloba. Here we go. That's more like it. That's more like it. I was like, I was so sus of that other plant as we were walking up. I was like, I got a bad feeling about that. I think Wait, this. Yeah. We called the other one Herda. Yeah, this, this Herda. Yeah, this is Herda. Was, uh, I know Loba. it to be shorter, to be under two feet generally. Um, totally. And 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 to have that sort of more uh, relaxed petal shape, like yeah. kind of folded back. Uh, there we okay. go. This one is uh, leaning a little bit, but um, this is. It's look how cute that is, though. Ugh, and I love this. Oh. It. It's so cute. Okay, Phenomenal. sorry. <laughs> I was like, well, I was like, I last... have to show you all the difference between that and her, uh, just or uh, triloba, since we are talking about the sweet sixteen after all. So sharp. Uh, last question from our lovely audience today. Uh, very high attendance, up up to over one hundred and seventy at, at one point today. Awesome. Uh, our dedicated visitors. Um, does the Chelsea Chop work on terminal flowering plants or just branching flower plants? Hmm. Does the Chelsea chop work on terminal flowering plants, or what did you say? What was the other part of that? Or the just the ones that branch out. And my armchair botany is at its limits here in in identifying the difference between the two things that Fawn is asking. Well, yeah. yeah, I don't think that's okay. So, um, what what my rule, which I totally just made up, is that if a plant could be eaten by a Deer, then you can Chelsea chop it. So what I'm avoiding is like toxic plants, like milkweeds, like uh, I don't know, dog. What 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 do we not Chelsea chop? People do it to um, cone flowers. I'm not craving. I don't do, do it to cone flowers. Don't do it to cone flowers. Um, we mostly just use it for our aster and helianthus species. We neither of us have a background in botany. Um, we are naturalists that have been trained. Uh, through our job experience and our love for nature and as Chris said armchair experts in that in some senses but um yes yeah, so unfortunately I don't have an answer to that question I'm assuming you mean terminally like at the top of the plant right like they're they're just flowering at the right top of the yeah plant. like cone really flower of, yeah, cone versus flower. Yeah. like what we're seeing like with the at some of the asters yeah. maybe or with the cup plant and yeah liatris yeah that's a brain scratcher great question you all been bringing the great questions here this past couple times so we really appreciate that absolutely <laughs> um mary joe hobbs you're gonna get access to the sweet 16 webinar recording in your resources that will be emailed to you after today's episode um and just continuous great feedback really wonderful crowd uh of of guests here and co-contributors <laughs> really this is a such a community conversation here I mean, it really uh, is. Learn. You all seriously make native plants at noon what it is. We couldn't do it without you. Um, so keep bringing your questions each month um, and come visit us in person too. Mm -hmm. Chris mentioned that we've got some work days coming up. So uh, this Saturday, I'll be working in the Deep Roots Garden here at the Discovery Center from 8 to 10. And then Wednesday evening next week, Alex and I will be out here um, helping folks learn tree identification and while they help us remove some trees from the landscape. We'll also talk about why wasps are really important, spicy pollinator friends. So <laughs> yeah. it'll be fun. And uh, we'll be sure to include those resources in the link following the broadcast today. Yeah, and you can always join us in person every first Friday of every month. We do our native landscape chat from one to two in the afternoon, every first Friday. It's free. Drop in. Come say hi. Exciting. And thank you so much, Sydney and Alex, as always, just delightful uh contributions <laughs> and and all of our guests what a great walkabout so nice to sit here at my desk although a little jealously and have you guide <laughs> me on, on a delightful outside walk today um a little harder than usual but not bad <laughs> hotter hey uh, cooler oh, than it was I, before it was I cool just could i mention one thing real quick we got a big heat wave coming in the next two oh. weeks don't forget to water your trees there's no shame in watering your native plant garden during that time as well in fact you know i don't think you realize this but chris just wrote a really great article about uh when in drought drag the hoses out yes. so you can read that on the pollinator our monthly newsletter as well as on deeproots.org 
Absolutely. Our final little slide here is a piece of gratitude. We really appreciate you joining us here at Deep Roots for our twice monthly webinar series. Join us in person for those landscape chats, those work days, and consider, uh, if able, to support us financially through your individual contributions. You're going to be able to rewatch this episode, the Sweet 16 Lunch and Learn with Sarah Beyer, and anyone that you've missed on our website or our YouTube channel. They're archived and available for the public. Um, with that, stay tuned. You should receive the resource list and a link to the YouTube recording uh, here shortly. Once again, from all of us here at Deep Roots, thank you. And remember that what you plant matters. <laughs>